and this is Arcane Mark. Welcome to Arcane Mark Design Tools. This week we're going to be talking about archetypes. So archetypes are a one of the hardest things to design in Pathfinder First Edition. And this is for Pathfinder First Edition to be clear. Archetypes are a little bit easier to design in Second Edition, but um, that's not what we're talking about now. First edition, archetypes are perhaps the hardest thing to design other than a brand new class. And they perhaps are more likely to fall into pit traps than um, designing a brand new class or other sort of pitfalls as well. This is because of the fact that a lot of instincts that we have when designing them turn out to lead us astray. But before we get started, let's just make sure. So an archetype in Pathfinder First Edition trades off some of the class features of the class that it's an archetype for. So for instance, you could have a an archetype for the fighter called the pirate that trades off some of the fighter's class features for some piratey themed abilities. Um, every archetype in Pathfinder First Edition has a class. There are a few that um, try to be for multiple classes and succeed in various degrees um, by removing different class features, for instance. And they replace the class features with some new class feature. The history of archetypes is that the Advanced Player's Guide was being designed and the idea was in the advanced player's guide to put in some alternate class features that you could take instead of the standard class features if you were for instance wanted to play a character with some diff slightly different domains or schools sub schools than the normal school powers for the school of what magic your wizard was taking however at the time some of the people who were writing up these alternate class features started putting them together into packages called archetypes and that's sort of how archetypes were born it's why the name of that chapter in advanced players guide is alternate class features and archetypes and not archetypes because the archetypes were sort of an emergent property whereas in some later books there are chapters entirely called archetypes and that have more information about some of how archetypes work for instance, one little known fact about the Advanced Class Guide is that the Advanced Class Guide's archetype chapter intro has some of the best examples of how to deal with archetypes in the past. Um, and it looks like Statler says, if you refresh the stream, it's updated. And I probably can't refresh since it is my stream. Actually, I can. Um, when you're streaming on Twitch, you act, or really anywhere else you're actually using a different piece of software to put the stream up there so I would be able to refresh and see that it's updated but thanks for that Statler that is that is useful to know alright so archetypes were created almost as emergent property they're packages of abilities uh, that replace other abilities that you have from the class that's fine. So when we're creating them, we have to come up with replacements for certain abilities with certain other abilities. That's the basics. We're going to jump directly from the basics to some advanced tips for archetype design. I'm not going to get into the sort of the next step after the basics where you have to determine how to phrase or because Phrasing a replacement is not super interesting, but I will say that when you're starting to create an archetype, the most important thing to have in your head is a concept. What is this archetype? You need to think of something cool because unless your archetype is actually poorly designed and really overpowered, if it's not cool, people aren't going to be interested in taking it. Like, there, there's mainly two reasons people take it. Is it's cool or it really fits their concept. Or it has some abilities that are a little bit extreme. So, you to start off, think of a cool archetype. Think of something that um, possibly is a literal fantasy archetype. Or from another subgenre that you want to add into the game. Try to think about something 
that could be expressed reasonably by mechanics. There are certainly some ideas of archetypes that might not be mechanically any different or just might not be a sort of a reimagining of a class in the same way that an archetype is. For instance, like a farmer is definitely something that you would have in a fantasy world. The farmer who grows up to become a hero is definitely an archetype, but it's probably not an archetype of any given class and might not be interesting. Now, that being said, I'm sure we could come up with a way to make a farmer-based idea pretty cool. But you do have to think carefully about what your concept is. Okay. Now that we've talked about that, I'm going to move into some slightly more advanced tips. Because there are some little pitfalls in archetype design that have tripped up even the most experienced archetype designers. I'm sure that you can find things that even we published at Paizo that, that do not match all of these pit, uh, these tips or that fall into some of these pitfalls. In fact, a lot of archetypes that are famous for being um, controversial do fall into some of these pitfalls and that can be part of the reason why they are. All right? So let's talk about advanced tips for archetypes. My first tip is match levels. You're going to be altering or trading out powers from the original class. So, be, due to that fact, oh, okay, we have um, a comment from Jam W. No. Farmer to hero sounds more like a Tui background than an archetype. You're absolutely right. Backgrounds are a concept that we added specifically to help address that. Traits sort of did, but the thing you got from traits were usually some kind of mechanical um, power boost that wasn't super associated with the actual story behind it and that people often hand waved the story behind it because they wanted the power boost. So backgrounds were happy to say that it helps you um, have some of those archetypes like Farmer to Hero. That's a good point. All right. So when we're matching levels, since we're altering or trading powers from the original class, you should take a look at the levels of the original powers. Never grant a new benefit at a level before the original class received the ability you replaced. Yes, some published archetypes have slipped out and, and they did this. But it's, it's a pretty sloppy thing to do because of a variety of reasons. If you grant something at a level that is before the ability it replaced, then that means that if you're multi-classing, or, or any other reason that you only want to look at the first few levels or the previous levels, your character has just gotten something for absolutely no price. There can be ex some exceptions to this where the, um, for instance, there's some ranger archetypes that replace spellcasting at, and then give a first level ability, but um, spellcasting for rangers right away gives the ability to use wands and certain other options. So it might work for that, but be very careful about it. It's also usually not a good idea to grant something new at a later level than the replaced ability because of the fact that then they're just missing an ability and they don't get anything for it until even later. So they're just worse at that level. If necessary, it's not really a flat no, like giving an ability before the um, replaced ability. But, so you can do it if you have to, and you might have to if you're doing some, if you're juggling some other issues with the other abilities you made. And Statler notes reactionary as a trait that people took for the mechanics and did not have their characters beat up by someone as a child. That's definitely true. And when I was doing some preliminaries for some of the Iconics, some of the later Iconics, Seltiel definitely was beat up as a child by his father, or adopted father, anyway. So, um, reactionary was the right choice, but most of the Iconics were not beat up by their parents slash relatives slash other children. So, they do not have reactionary. Alright. So, we know that we're supposed to match levels. And sometimes, you just can't match levels. And that's okay. There are ways around matching levels if you have some kind of a mismatch. And we'll get to that after we talk about matching kind. 
But what does matching kind mean? Well, you generally want to replace an ability with another ability that's in the same vein, but fitting for your archetype. Replacing all the class's defensive and skill-based abilities with offensive abilities is going to create an imbalanced archetype. To use a druid, for example, consider replacing Resist Nature's Lore, a large but extremely situational defensive ability, with another situational defensive ability, rather than with something that's offensive or always applies. This isn't a hard rule, and sometimes you'll have to make the call to cross the streams. Stop and think before you do, and when switching from situational to non-situational, defensive to offensive, and so on, you need to make sure the ability is of lesser magnitude if you want the trade to be more fair. So, you could replace Resist Nature's Lore with something that does not give plus 4 to saves, but does give it less situationally, for example. Or plus 4 to a different situation, which you'll see in some Druid archetypes. If it went into offense, and was less situational, it should go way down. But, let's say it went to offense, but it was against Fey. Well, it still shouldn't be a plus 4, because that is a ridiculously big boost to attack bonus, or save DC, or things like that. But it might not have to drop quite as much as it would if it was becoming an offensive boost that was not situational for Resist Nature's Lore. Um, these are some examples of matching kind. So what about mismatches? Because you kind of are going to have mismatches. As long as you don't give things before the level where you actually traded them off, you can be fancy and make trades that balance mismatches. Maybe you might even intentionally make trades that are more powerful than than would be fair, and other trades that are less powerful than would be fair, and try to, to have this balance out overall. If you do this, though, you need to make sure, sort of based on the matching levels idea, that you never put the more powerful trades earlier in the level progression. For instance, imagine an archetype for a monk that gained ridiculously powerful trades on first level abilities, and then didn't do anything else, and then at level 20, it traded Perfect Self for something really bad that was clearly worse than Perfect Self. Well, you would have claimed, well, okay, I have a really good trade at first. I have one really good trade and one really bad trade that's equal. It's obviously not equal because you're playing 19 levels with the up trade. And then you may never even get to the down trade. That's similar to giving out a power for free at earlier levels before the trade-off. Now... Obviously, giving a really bad ability at first level or uh, and then waiting until 20th level for a ridiculously better than perfect self ability is bad. It's not equally bad. It's a little bit less bad, but it's still really bad. You don't want to make people wait that long. But you also pretty much never want to give them the up shifted ability first. Again, they can multi-class in, grab that first level ability, and then leave. So you always have to consider about that in Pathfinder 1st Edition. Um, that's one of the repercussions with um, Pathfinder 1st Edition multi-classing. Speaking of repercussions, when you design an archetype, you need to deal with the repercussions of what you do. If you change or remove an ability, make sure you check the other class features and make sure you've removed or explained any abilities that no longer work. A classic example of this is any ranger archetype that alters or removes favorite enemy and then doesn't address any of the other abilities that only work on favorite enemies. So make sure to take a look if you've messed around with some of the abilities and make sure that the other abilities in the class are not sort of dependent on those abilities in a way that you have not dealt with yet. And if they are, then take care of it. All right. So the next thing that you have to think about here is limitations in archetypes. And the, this is one that your instinct may be wrong on. So some archetypes try to grant extra powers because they limit the character to, say, using a particular weapon, choosing a particular type of animal companion, maybe a particular school of magic for a wizard or other option. All right. So, show of, I don't know, uh, type in the chat. Who thinks that an archetype for a wizard that said um, something like, you must choose evocation as your specialty school, or maybe you must choose conjuration, and then gave a bunch of abilities that's better than the evoker or conjurer, um, seems like a good place to start for an archetype. 
who thinks it's not. You can type it out in the chat what you think, and we'll see where our instincts land. Let's see. All right, no one so far, but I'll just tell you anyway. It turns out that when you're in that situation, it is not a good idea. Unless, and even then I'm going to get into caveats, unless you're limiting to something that is just legitimately bad as the limitation. And even then, we'll get to the caveat later. But let's talk about when you're not limiting to something that's legitimately bad. You're limiting, say, the your fighters. Like, you must use ranged weapons. Or you must use the longbow. Or you must use a falchion. Or for a wizard, you must be a conjurer. So, the limitation isn't actually a real limitation. Since the player selecting the archetype chose the archetype because they want to use the falchion or the longbow or be a conjurer. For instance, an archetype for wizards about being a conjurer should not gain extra powers in exchange for res restricting the wizard to playing a conjurer, since if she didn't want to be a conjurer, the player would have chosen a different archetype. The same applies for any other similar situation. If the idea of restrictions not mattering if the player was going to make that choice anyway, doesn't seem natural to you when I tell, when I say it, let's consider the following situation. So our status quo is that Wizard has eight specialties and you pick them, you get certain benefits for them. It's generally considered that that is a balanced situation with no archetypes. Now imagine there were eight new Wizard archetypes in my book, Mark's Unbalanced Archetypes of Golarian, one for each Wizard school. Each one of these eight new archetypes grants fabulous powers to you in exchange for being restricted to that particular school with no other drawbacks. Now we see we have a problem because no matter which school a wizard picks, they're suddenly gaining fabulous powers for free compared to the baseline where we said was probably balanced where they just picked a school and got what the class gave you for the school. And Statler says, so every conjurer would choose the archetype Yes, that's right. So, this is a major trap that a, that actually a fair number of published archetypes might fall into, and it is a serious problem. So, what happens if you want to give benefits for something that's legitimately a subpar choice? Like, let's say a fighter archetype for dagger users. Well, the fighter could have used kukris instead of daggers, and other than being able to throw them, kukris are just better daggers. They have an 18 to 20 crit range. So you could have an archetype that, for instance, is mostly balanced, but somewhere in there it throws in something that's about equal to the 18 to 20 versus 19 to 20 crit range. I, that, that's just one example of something. This was fine, except for one thing. And as a home GM, which most of you probably are, you do have a way around this, which is one of the biggest sort of issues that Pathfinder 1st Edition built up over time. Because Pathfinder 1st Edition is an awesome system. I love Pathfinder 1st Edition. It got a lot of power in what you can do. But one of the things it built up over time is all sort. even in published product for Paizo, everybody thought, I'm going to be the one who creates a feat or a magic item or a spell or archetype or something that makes up for a certain fighting style or choice that is subpar and makes it on par and then you pick six or seven of those different things that have all been published that all make the same option are exactly balanced let, let's assume a lot of them are exactly balanced to bring that subpar option up from wherever it was below bar up to the bar and now you've taken it seven times Obviously, since those all cost something, like let's say it's a feat, it needs to be a feat that gives you not only enough to bring it up to speed, but also as much as a feat is worth, right? Because it costs you a feat. Otherwise, you're just down a feat. Um, so now you've taken that seven times, and whatever amount your option was worse than the par, you're now seven times that much above the par. And so this is something that a home GM 
can very naturally say, hey guys, uh, this is obviously seven things that are trying to compensate for the fact that you're using improvised weapons. We're not going to use all those together because now your improvised weapon is four times as powerful as anybody's regular weapon could be. So just keep that in mind when you're creating an archetype like this. If it's for your home game, you're going to be fine because you you will know that you can restrict any sort of weird combinations with other abilities that are also meant to solve the same problem or the same situation. All right. So here's the last overall design tip that is a serious problem um, that can happen to you. And this can happen to you even if it's not your fault at all. So let's say you traded away a class feature for something. And let's say that class feature was a really important class feature that is super powerful, um, like mutagen. And you gave something, mutagen is very strong for alchemists, and you gave something equally strong. And then somebody else comes in, or somebody has come in, and you need to make sure whether they did that or not, and creates a talent or discovery or something that says, ah, oh, you get mutagen back. So the moment that happens, retroactively, first of all, your archetype got thrown off. And second of all, all future archetypes now need to re recognize that this sort of uh, decision for talents and discoveries has meant that when you trade off mutagen, what you're really trading off is less than one discovery slot. Maybe a f almost equal to one discovery slot. Why, why is that? Well, because they can spend a discovery slot if they want the th mutagen. If they don't want mutagen, they don't have to spend the discovery slot. So discovery slot has now become more powerful or sort of has now become the thing that you're actually trading away. And that's important because of the fact that the amount you would give for taking away one discovery slot is probably a discovery. Whereas the amount that you would, something that is roughly as good as a discovery. Whereas the amount that you would give for taking away mutagen, if you couldn't just get it back, no matter what, a lot more. So if you want to actually trade off a really powerful ability that you can inexplicably get back with a talent or discovery or feat, then you need to make sure that that archetype can never get that thing back. Because of the fact that otherwise you're forced to give a weaker thing in return. Because the character that just spends one discovery or talent or feat and gets back the ability you traded off. Now is way better than somebody who didn't take the archetype. Alright. So that is all of the overall tips. I'm going to give one for spellcasters. And... This one for spellcasters is definitely something that a lot of people don't realize, which is caster level increases. There's a reason the orange iron stone costs 40,000 gold pieces and that spellcaster players still buy it when they have the money. Caster level increases in Pathfinder First Edition are very powerful. In fact, generally, they are too powerful to give in an archetype. Don't make an archetype that grants overall caster level increase or that's limited to something that's not really a limit or varies by campaign like caster level boost underground or when activating ability you are already going to be activating like the War Priest's Sacred Weapon or the Druid <clears throat> Druid's Wild Shape or Arcane Pool. Instead, consider how you could grant a thematic or lesser benefit. For instance, perhaps that you have a Geometrist archetype that gains a caster level increase for the purpose of determining spell range by drawing geometry, or a time mage that gains a castle level increase for the purpose of determining duration. By splitting things out, you know what you're getting into. Whereas spells are varied enough that a flat bonus to all caster levels grants a potpourri of powerful effects, scaling bark skin to more AC, more damage dice on all blast spells, and so on. There's certainly a lot of, of archetypes that are out there that would maybe be otherwise very thematic and mostly balanced archetypes, but then give a large caster level increase. And that makes them um, that makes them a little bit more troublesome due to the fact that 
the caster level increase is going to drastically raise the level of the spellcaster in a way you can't predict unless you pick which elements of caster level you're going to uh, be raising. All right, so we've given out some general tips. Let's go class by class, and Alchemist is a great one to start with, not only because it's alphabetically first, but because it falls into some of those earlier tips. So, and even I use it as an example for Mutagen. So, let's talk about Alchemist. Alchemists have two major pitfalls. And the first one is something that maybe could be considered a general tip. So, it's great that we're doing it first. Which is, the Alchemist class has several distinct builds. Ever since the very beginning, the first Alchemist guide, there was the... The, the Bomber and the Mr. Hyde build, right? The Mad Bomber and the Mr. Hyde. There's more builds than that, but at the very least, those two are definitely considered to be quite powerful, quite effective alchemists, where you build based on bombing, you are usually got some dexterity and intelligence. That's my character in Curse of the Crimson Throne, who saved the day against really high AC, but lower touch AC monsters, or... Things that resisted and had DR against everything with my force bomb, rapid bomb, everything dies. And then the, uh, the Mr. Hyde build just has the most strength and beats the crap out of anything. So those are two builds. And here let's talk into this general archetype tip that as evidenced with the Alchemist. When you have a class that has certain builds, and I'm going to talk about the Mr. Hyde here in particular, because the bomber build is obviously going to use Mutagen to get up its Dexterity, or a Cognatogen to get up its Intelligence, or something like that, because Mutagen is ridiculously powerful for any character, no matter what. It gives us just a ton of stuff. But the Mr. Hyde build, um, while the Mr. Hyde build and the Bomber build both treat Mutagen as being very important, the Mr. Hyde build doesn't treat Bombs in the same way as the Bomber build. I mean, I guess obviously because the Bomber build is called the Bomber build. Mr. High Belt is not, like, going to scoff completely at having the bombs. It's a backup ranged option you can use in a pinch. But it's definitely not the same feature for the Mr. Hyde character as it is for the bomber. And this can apply to other classes, but Alchemist is one of the big classes that it applies to. Sometimes when you have a class that's just big and full of features... And you've built very, very um, closely around a certain feature in your build. And you know that you've done that already. It actually devalues certain options in the build that you weren't going to use anyway. Or we're going to use in a different way. Um, so, where am I getting to with this? Well, let's say we made a, an option that weakens or removes bombs. If we were going to do this to the Mad Bomber build... We better give the Mad Bomber something ridiculously strong to make up for that, right? Because I've just taken away the Mad Bomber's entire build. But here's the problem. We shouldn't make an archetype that removes bombs and then try to give the Mad Bomber build something to replace that. Why? Because that's not who's going to take the archetype. If we make an archetype that is about de-emphasizing or removing bombs... That's already an archetype the Mad Bomber doesn't want, will never take. It's an archetype that Mr. Hyde says, oh yeah, we're going to remove my backup option. Give me something else then. You need to assume when you remove something or substantially weaken it, that you've already in a situation where the character is building towards something else. If it's a class where you can so, obviously, if you if you do something like limited spellcasting on a wizard, they're not going to be making a wizard build that wasn't spellcasting. So, that's you're in the clear. But when you're de-emphasizing something that is an optional part of the, uh, that's in the class that's built in, but that is not always as emphasized in the builds, you need to make, give something that is equally valuable to, to the build that is not using it the most. Now, bombs were, no, were non-negligible, even for Mr. Hyde. They're a good backup. You still should give something good. But you should not give something that is crazily good um, in exchange. And you definitely should not give something that is really, 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 really good for Mr. Hyde. 
and that directly improves Mr. Hyde's abilities to be Mr. Hyde and do even more melee damage by a lot. Um, well, you probably know where I'm getting with this um, now that we've gone this far in the example. So, for instance, um, since the bombs are a situational backup for when something's flying or is other than annoying for Mr. Hyde, giving something more situational, like maybe in the Ectochimist archetype, is a pretty solid way to go. The Ectochimist stuff is situational, but it's really useful in that situation and doesn't force you to go to a backup ranged option. Non-bomb alchemists would still take that archetype because they were not necessarily going to use their bombs that much anyway. The bomb alchemists obviously won't, but that's not who you're balancing it for. Um, so, basically, uh, the problem is that there are some archetypes, though, like, say, vivisectionist, where you have a situation where you've traded away bombs for something that is a drastic damage increase to the Mr. Hyde build. That's a good example of an archetype that was very early on, like, and before archetypes were really understood quite as much as they are now. Now, it's possible that you can try to replace bombs with an ability that isn't useful to the non-bomb build, which the non-bomb build are generally martial characters that rely on extreme ability boosts from mutagens and buffs from extracts. This is actually really hard to do. Um, like, you know, you'd be like, I'm going to create a brand new build that Mr. Hyde doesn't even want, and I'm going to give you a really strong thing in place for bombs. That would work if you could do it. You can also give something really, really good to an alchemist archetype if you remove both mutagens and bombs, because at that point, you've removed mut mutagens and Remember, when we say remove mutagens, we mean actually remove them and prevent you from taking them again. And then you've removed bombs, so really they don't have anywhere to go from there. So you could give them something really significant to do. Because they're not the Mr. Hyde and they're not the bomber at that point. So, speaking of which, remember the mutagen class feature of Alchemist is overall its most powerful single class feature across all builds. It's so good that ideally you could give something really good in exchange for it, except, oh no, a discovery can give you bad mutagen. Uh, this means when you replace mutagen, you can only replace it with a single discovery or make sure they can't get mutagen back. Jam W. No says, at that point, is it really still an alchemist? Well, it might be. You would want to give it something alchemical that was not bombs and mutagens. Like, for instance, you could create one that gets a lot of, like, significant number more extracts than any other alchemist. Let's say you were making an archetype that started with the ability to do infusions and had an extra extract per slot, and that might not even be where you stop, but that... Or sorry, an extra extract slot per level. But that could be a starting point. You definitely could do that if you knew this person was the, one, the extract master, for example. You can give something that's pretty defining, and it might be very alchemist-y, um, if you got rid of both of them. That's an option, though. You don't have to. You absolutely can get rid of one and not the other pretty easily. You just need to be sure what you're giving. Um, and then when we talk about discoveries, discoveries are typically significantly more powerful than a feat. So a high percentage of Alchemist players take extra discovery with the majority of their feats. In theory, if you want the architect to give something really nice uh, and you can't find another way to balance it, if you can trade out all of the low-level discoveries in a row without missing even a single one, you could give extra abilities to that Alchemist archetype that you wouldn't normally give because that prevents the Alchemist from taking extra discovery for a while. And therefore, it means that the trade-offs you've made are worth more than normal for discoveries, but you've also prevented feats from being turned into the more powerful discoveries. So you can give the Alchemist cooler stuff, which is a weird and kind of tricky thing to do, but is possibly allows you to give some really cool things to the alchemist. Alright, so what about barbarian archetypes? Well, with barbarian archetypes, you should think about whether you can make the barbarian archetype work for both the chained and the unchained barbarian, because it usually doesn't take that much to make it work for both, and it would be cool to make it work for both. 
Um, when it comes to Barbarian Archetypes, they're much simpler to deal with than Alchemist Archetypes. There are fewer weird things to think about. But one thing to think about is Rage Cycling. So you might want to avoid something that's really powerful and is once per range. As there are popular Rage Cycling builds that make those abilities instead have no limits. Because you just go in and out of Rage constantly. And... Uh, find some way to remove the drawbacks and the time limit on going back into rage such as being immune to fatigue and then suddenly that once per rage is unlimited so be careful about once per rage super strong abilities and also mind the scald when designing rage powers consider that the scald might hand those out to everybody on the team both from a balanced perspective and when wording your rage powers um, or just new abilities that are archetype abilities that are essentially rage powers. If the Scald gives it to everybody, then if your wording is weird and doesn't assume that it could be on everybody, it might be hard to adjudicate. Alright, so what about the Bard? Well, uh, the Bard is a little bit tricky for archetypes. For one thing, there's already the fact that the definition of performances in the core rulebook was not necessarily future-proof uh, against the fact that archetypes might give different types of performances that work really differently, which is in itself its own giant topic. So I'm not going to talk about that. It's too big. I'm going to talk about being a balanced bard archetype. So let's talk about Inspire Courage. Keep in mind that the bard's most powerful performance is the first level performance Inspire Courage. Bards who don't use magic to keep up multiple performances are only situationally going to use your other performances in combat. That means if you replace other combat performances that aren't Inspire Courage, they're not worth that much because they were going to use Inspire Courage. If you replace, especially if you replace them with something that is not a combat performance, that's just a, some kind of boost to their character. But if you replace Inspire Courage, you better give them something really good that they want to use. Because otherwise, they're going to have to fall back on the backup performances with Bard, which we already said are not as good as Inspire Courage. Which means that they've gone down. So be very careful about what you do with Inspire Courage. Inspire Courage is a beastly ability that is very, very powerful and is kind of game-changing. If you have a Bard throwing up Good Hope and Inspire Courage, suddenly... A core rogue can contribute a lot to the party. Ah, Statler has said, Inspire Courage, Good Hope, Sit Back and Watch. Which, uh, I think he typed even before I had said, Inspire Courage and Good Hope. So, yes. And Aguna, Alex Aguna says, Hey, Mark. Hello, Alex. Alright. So, that is the deal with Bards. Let's move on from Bards to Clerics. Cleric is tricky. It has very few class features. It's very hard to actually make a solid cleric archetype. First of all, juggling domains. Trading out the first domain is not worth as much as you might think. The flexibility on domain spells could help if, we, for, if, for instance, they don't have one domain with good domain spells, but between the two they have good domain spells. And having the second power is definitely good. But it's basically giving you, it's worth as much as one power and flexible domain spells. But if you trade both domains, you actually lose a huge number of spells per day. So you better give a lot of things to the Cleric Archetype if you lose both domains. I'm not even sure you want to do that because that's one of the key features of the Cleric. But if you do, give a lot of things. How about proficiencies? All right. If you trade out medium armor proficiency for most clerics, you're saving them about 3,000 gold pieces and costing them about 2 AC. So don't replace this with an ability worth more than that, really, because that's about all you've done. And for some clerics who have really, really high dexterity, it's possible that you've done even less than that, but probably not. Shield proficiency is pretty much not really relevant as a switch off because heavy shields prevent spell casting and light shields and bucklers don't have any armor check penalty if they're masterwork. So the proficiency in Pathfinder First Edition doesn't do anything very important. Um, an example. Uh, so then there's channeling. Now you might be tempted to trade out like a few d sixes of the channel for powerful abilities each time, 
Uh, after the first few times you steal from Channel Energy, it starts to become so weak in the D6s that you might as well have traded out the whole ability other than if somebody is going to take some kind of cheesy add-on effect to the, to the channel. So the other D6s you're taking out aren't really worth very much at that point. So don't trade out separate D6s for powerful abilities. Instead, you really want to think about whether what you've given is worth more than all of channel energy. The upper limit on the sum of your trade-offs for D6s should be less powerful for channel energy. For example, the Evangelist archetype does not follow this rule because it gives Inspire Courage, which we just talked about. Another thing to think about with clerics is that there's definitely a War Priest build that goes in there and beats people up, but there's also definitely cloistered-ish builds. And while you don't want to have one, an archetype that is sort of gives as little to you for as many trade-offs as, say, the Cloistered Cleric um, archetype, you definitely don't want to give too much to, to a Cleric for, like, lowering its base attack bonus or other options that, or, say, taking away some of its weapon proficiencies or other options that keep them out of the front line due to the fact that some clerics already weren't going to do that, and we've already talked about what you do for trade-offs with something that someone was already not going to do. All right, what about Druid? Ah, and Jam W No says, Evangelist Cleric is my PFS-1. It's my PFS-1 also, Jam W No. Uh, is also a cleric who likes to evangelize. All right, Druid. Unlike Cleric, Druid has more than one of the most powerful non-spellcasting abilities in the game and has more leeway for archetypes. For Nature Bond, an animal companion is significantly more powerful than a domain, except for domains that also grant an animal companion thanks to boon companions screwing them up. If your archetype locks in another domain that does not grant an animal companion, you might gain a little bit of leeway even though you didn't trade anything out. Certain animal companions, such as Big Cat and Velociraptor, are overpowered compared to the other animal companions. If your archetype restricts animal choices to ones that are less powerful, you also gain a little bit of leeway. But you wouldn't gain any leeway for restricting to options if the Big Cat, the Velociraptor, or any of the st really strong choices were still on the list. Because people were... This, the, the, the basic tip that we said earlier on. Wild Shape is enormously potent. You can often get away with doing something pretty splashy if you remove it and replace it with something else that isn't as extreme as Wild Shape. You get some room to play with the other abilities as well. Remember, don't go too strong on abilities that come before level 4 because that's when the Wild Shape change happened. Alright, let's talk about Fighter. Alright, so, the most important ability the fighter class has until extremely high levels is the increase in its weapon training bonus for its top tier weapons. Are you gaining weapon training in other groups? Barely important. That's hardly helpful at all. Trading it out for something strong is just making the fighter more powerful than it was before. If that's what you want to do, fine. Otherwise, not super important. Weapon training in the top group is the big deal. Bravery doesn't really help although we did try to put out some feats later on to help increase bravery and make it a little more badass it also doesn't help the gloves of dueling are ridiculous as soon as you have weapon training one boom gloves of dueling there you go um, armor training is also pretty good though the only other useful and unique class feature until really high levels for the fighters armor training it's not as powerful as the brawler swashbuckler or gunslinger's ability to flat out get plus one AC it will often lead to more AC and give some movement speed. It does significantly constrain the fighter. Even in full plate, a non-archer fighter is going to need to focus on dexterity a fair amount more than other martial characters would need to to keep getting the AC bonuses from armor training. Alright, the last one. Please don't give fighter-only feats and weapon training to non-fighters. This isn't really about fighters, but the, the poor class has so few unique abilities. Letting other classes take their goodies makes fighters cry. Alright, so... Let's see. What about the Gunslinger? Some of the Gunslinger's deeds are very powerful. Some are not useful at all, and most Gunslingers rarely use them. This can lead to issues if you don't keep in mind which deeds you're trading out for new deeds. You want to switch useful deeds for useful new abilities, less useful deeds for less useful new abilities. 
For example, Pistol Whip, Dead Shot, and Startling Shot aren't as important as Quick Clear. Some deeds are situational on a build. For instance, Dead Eye is pretty important with a pistol, but not so with a musket. Misfire. Misfire is Gunslinger's main balancing factor. As a suggestion, don't reduce Misfire at all. As a commandment, never eliminate Misfire flat out. Many balancing factors give a benefit by increasing Misfire, or play around with what the Misfire chances are. If you flat out eliminate it, rather than reducing it, you've thrown all those balancing factors out the window. Reducing it could still be overpowered, but at least is part of the framework of up and down trade-offs that you've had in there. All right, uh, gun training. The fact that gunslingers get dexterity to damage at fifth level is basically the capstone ability of the class compared to just being somebody else with a gun. You can get a lot of leeway by removing this ability, and if you don't remove it, you could take away a lot of other things without seriously weakening the class offensively. So be careful. All right, Jam W No says, lots of things say you come as a fighter of level minus N though, or am I misremembering? Sometimes, sometimes they give you a pretty decent level, though, and honestly, being being level minus N is not a, too big of a deal. But, like, the Malthuni Arsenal Chaplain really, really gives you a huge amount of the fighter's stuff onto a war priest, who's a 6th level caster, for example. Um, let's see. The Inquisitor. Let's do the Inquisitor last today. There are definitely other classes, and if people really like this archetype stuff, we can get into some of them later. Inquisitor is one of the classes that has the most um, potential for making a mistake other than Alchemist. So, the Inquisitor has many abilities. Don't lose focus on that theme that I told you at the beginning to start with. Like the Monk and the Bard, the Inquisitor has a ton of different little abilities easy to lose focus on the general rules. Make sure you keep to them. Bane and Judgment, let's talk about that. These two abilities are the Inquisitor's bread and butter for offense. If you're not losing Bane or Judgment, you better not be increasing offense numbers in your archetype. Always replace both if you're gaining offensive ability that is more powerful than either one individually. For instance, if you gain Smite Evil, that is more powerful than either Bane or Judgment individually. If you gain Weapon Training, that is more powerful than either Bane or Judgment individually. While it has limited rounds and is thus more limited in use, Bane provides a greater offensive boost than Judgment from the level you get it, which could be f before level 5 with a Bane Baldrick, until level 15 or so, which is most play time. You usually don't play too much in, after level 15. Keep that in mind too. If you replace one of those abilities, especially Bane, for a non-offense ability, You've opened up a lot of options and space for yourself. If you haven't, you might not have opened up as much space as you think. And let's talk about the next tip. Inquisitor stole my lunch money. Have you ever heard someone say that the Inquisitor stole their class's lunch money? Well, the Inquisitor is one of the most likely classes to do that because of its many abilities, particularly if you're not careful with the trades. It's possible to trade out Inquisitor abilities for other classes' abilities until you've given the Inquisitor all of the other classes' most iconic abilities, while still having a bunch of Inquisitor abilities left. It's kind of like all the way back in the uh, Player's Option books um, in 2nd Edition D&D, where you could make a cleric who just traded out all the spheres of magic and got all the fighter's abilities, literally all of them, and had points left over. So... This could happen on the Inquisitor. Some other classes also have a bunch of abilities, but for whatever reason, Inquisitors are the ones that tend to do this the most. My theory is because Judgment is on the class chart, so many different entries, that it uh, oftentimes it's easy to remove Judgment, which you're really just removing Judgment, but then you kind of are like, but I actually removed these eight different things that are on the Inquisitor, then you give eight different things and replace Judgment instead of something that's equal to Judgment. So it's not a good situation if you've replaced all of another class's most unique abilities and only some of the Inquisitor's abilities. For example, the Sacred Hunt Master Inquisitor does not lose Bane. It just gains pretty much all of the Hunter's best abilities for Judgment. Uh, while the Relic Hunter archetype avoids this just by a smidge because it loses both Bane and Judgment. So, therefore, even though it gets a lot of the occultist best stuff, it kind of avoids it because it's just kind of just a different parallel option. Alright, 
So we've still got Magus Monk, Oracle, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Vigilante, Witch, and Wizard. But we can always talk about those later if we want to. So, um, I'm going to ask, does anybody have any questions? In addition, let's see. We're going to, just for everybody who's still here, we're going to be figuring out Tuesday's episode. Thursday's episode is definitely going to be Mark asks Linda Zeiss Palmer. Um, all right, so it says here, Alex Lagoons, did you talk about the shifter already? The shifter is not on my list because that came out after I sort of came up with some of these architect guidelines. Uh, Statler says, sounds like a part two for this topic is needed. Uh, maybe. I think that part two for this topic would not fill up an entire episode, uh, be but it would possibly be a partial episode uh, where we talk about some of the other classes. Really, now that we've done the Alchemist and the Inquisitor, where we've really put our, our skills into play, a lot of the other ones are just going to be, oh, this is the same thing that we were talking about before, just with a little different nuance. It's still, I wouldn't say, is not useful. But we definitely can do a second part of this episode if people liked it. Looks like so far, not as many people were watching this as actually voted for it on... Um, on the social media, but we'll, we'll take a look. All right, so um, before we get into figuring out Tuesday's episode, as I said, Thursday is Mark Ask Linda Zeiss Palmer. Gonna interview Linda about all sorts of stuff. It should be a lot of fun. And let's say goodbye to YouTube and then figure out Tuesday's episode. So, bye YouTube. See you next time. All right.